Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this really exciting LSE Sociology event. Uh, I'm Sara Salem. I am an assistant professor at the LSE Department of Sociology and this event was organized um, by both LSE Sociology and by the LSE, by LSE Human Rights. So it's a book discussion of a really incredible book that came out recently, which I have here. Everybody go and buy it. Um, or if it's on Libgen, <laughs> um, but everyone should kind of support this, uh, yeah, this amazing press and this amazing book. And it's Adam Elliott Cooper's book, Black Resistance to British Policing. So a special thanks to Adam for being here and also to Vanessa, SM and Nivi for joining us. And just to say also a special thank you to Amy Gordon, Laura Kemp and Maddie Giles who helped to organize this event. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the book and then also introduce um, our speakers and then we'll get started. So the book, I think, uh, is, is a really kind of incredible and unique exploration of a lot. But I think what really stood out to me about this particular book was the way it pays so much attention to multiple levels. So the global and the local, the historical, the contemporary, but also to the question of kind of how structures create um, inequalities, but also how resistance is really crucial to thinking about those inequalities as well. And I think while I was reading it, I was also really struck by this very careful kind of attention to anti-colonialism and anti-colonial histories and ways of thinking as important to the way we understand racism in the present as well. And before I introduce everyone, I just wanted to read out, I think, um, a really short paragraph that stood out to me that I think captures uh, the particular dimensions that I, I really enjoyed. So um, Adam writes that keeping the dirty business of slavery, genocide and racist rule physically distant from the British mainland is one of the ways in which Britain was able to absolve itself and retain its national pride. The thousands of miles that separated the British mainland from the overt racial governance of its colonies meant that it could also construct a conceptual barrier between racism and its own self image. Yet racism, to paraphrase Stuart Hall, is as British as the sugar in a cup of tea. Therefore, this book urges us to reckon with colonialism and its racist legacies so that we can better understand um, recent histories of policing and resistance on the British mainland. And just to reiterate, resistance is really central to this book. And there's a lot of incredible and amazing um, ethnographic work as well with activist groups, um, especially around Black Lives Matter 2020, around how people understand policing and what it means to resist it in the present. So we're going to start with Adam, who will talk a little bit about the book. Then we'll hear from each respondent before coming back to Adam for any responses or engagements. And then we'll open up to audience Q&A. Just to let you know, you can send in questions either by posting them on the Facebook chat or the comment section, or you can tweet at LSE Sociology or email sociology.media at lse.ac.uk. So Adam Elliott Cooper is a lecturer in the Department of Politics at Queen Mary University of London. He received his PhD from the School of Geography and Environment at Oxford in 2016. He has previously worked as a researcher in the Department of Philosophy at UCL, as well as the University of Warwick and King's College London. His first monograph, which we're discussing today, Black Resistance to British Policing, was published by Manchester University Press in May 2021. He's also a co-author of another book called Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State, which was published by Pluto Press in 2021 as well. Um, and he also has a, an article forthcoming entitled The UK is Not Innocent, uh, Reflections on the Rise of Black Lives Matter in Britain in South Atlantic Quarterly. And in addition to this, he sits on the board of the Monitoring Group, which is an anti-racist organization challenging state racisms and racial violence. Our first speaker is Vanessa um, Thompson, who is currently a lecturer in social and cultural anthropology at European University Viadria, Viadrina in Germany, an incoming assistant professor in Black Studies at the Department of Gender Studies at Queen's University Canada. Her interests are in Black Studies, Gender Studies, Anti-Colonial Theories, Critiques of Policing, International Dimensions of Abolition, and Activist Ethnographies. 
She has published on blackness and black social movements in Germany and France and Europe more broadly, and is currently finishing her book manuscript on black urban anti-racist movements in France and transnational solidarities, which will also come, up with, come out with Manchester University Press. She's also the co-editor of Abolition, a Reader, um, as well as a special issue on black feminisms with Femina Politica, which will come out in December 2021. Second speaker is Nivi Manchando, who joined the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary in 2017, after previously working at the LSE and the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. She completed her PhD in 2014 from the University of Cambridge, um, where her thesis, Imagining Afghanistan, the History and Politics of Imperial Knowledge Production, was awarded the best PhD dissertation in the arts and social sciences. And her first book, Imagining Afghanistan, by the same, in the same title, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020, which explores Anglophone practices of knowledge cultivation and representational strategies, arguing that Afghanistan occupies a distinctive place in the colonial imagination. And this book, um, this year, won the British International Studies Association's LHM Ling's Outstanding First Book Prize. Nivi just got off a very long flight. <laughs> so it's a testament to how amazing Adam's book is that she is here <laughs> to talk to us about it. Um, and last but not least, we have SM Rodriguez, who is Assistant Professor of Gender Rights and Human Rights at the LSE. Dr. Rodriguez is a critical criminologist and gender theorist, primarily interested in racialized criminalization and transnational transformative justice movements. They're the author of the book, The Economies of Queer Inclusion, Transnational Organizing for LGBTI Rights in Uganda, which was published in 2019. Their forthcoming book, Abolition in the Academy, Scholar Activism and the Movement for Penal Abolition, looks at the role of scholars in propagating the seeds of abolitionist resistance. A committed community organizer from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Rodriguez also currently serves on the board of directors of the Audre Lorde Project, the largest organization for and of queer people of color in the United States. So really excited to have all of you here and I will now stop talking and hand it over to you, Adam. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. And a massive thank you to SM, Vanessa and Nivi. It's a real honor to have uh, such inspiring and incredible people um, engage with the ideas um, that I put down in the book. So thank you so much uh, for coming today. And of course, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation from LSD Sociology and Human Rights, um, organized by Sara and everyone else there. So um, yeah, much appreciated. Uh, so the book, um, Black Resistance to British Policing, I guess began with a series of blog articles that I wrote in 2011. And at this time, I was working as a youth worker in uh, Hackney in the area of North East London, where I was running education projects and stuff with young uh, Black and Asian people in the area. And I began writing blog posts because although I quite enjoyed the work that I was doing, some of it anyway, there was a huge amount happening outside of my normal kind of prescribed youth work duties, which appeared to be a lot more important and urgent. Um, and in many ways exciting. Um, and that was organizing in relation to policing and resistance to uh, police harassment, violence, arrest, um, intimidation, a whole host of issues being faced by the young people that uh, I was working with. And I started writing blog articles because in 2011, something really, um, something bigger than those kinds of educational and, and, and youth-led projects took place. And those were three quite high profile killings at the hands of the police. Uh, the first was in the February of 2011, um, and a reggae artist called Smiley Culture uh, died at the hands of the police when he, um, his home was raided. And according to the police, he went to the kitchen to make himself a cup of tea and stabbed himself to death. Um, a few months later, a man called Kingsley Burrell, a young black man in Birmingham in the West Midlands, uh, died of asphyxiation after he was restrained by a number of police officers dying in circumstances not dissimilar to that of George Floyd almost a decade later. And in, in August of 2011, perhaps most famously, Mark Duggan um, was shot and killed by police, leading to not only uh, protests in ways that were similar to that of following the deaths of Smiley Culture and Kingsley Burrell, but of course, 
four days of civil unrest um, and uh, uh, rebellions across England. But what interested me really about what was taking place wasn't necessarily uh, the rebellions and the rioting which gained so much media coverage. It was the community response to those rebellions. So un un unsurprisingly, there was a massive escalation in policing, uh, particularly um, stops and searches, people being questioned, people being arrested, raids on people's homes, as well as instances of, of brutality. And a number of defence campaigns arose in response to this intensification of police and, and, and prison power. And I started to volunteer with these organisations and write about what was taking place in places like Tottenham and elsewhere. And it was from that that I realised there was a movement beginning to emerge or beginning to be re-galvanised. Um, and, I, and I remember feeling quite frustrated with a lot of commentators who claimed that what took place in 2011 wasn't political or didn't signify a, a articulation of black politics or radical politics or sometimes any kind of politics at all. And instead, I, I, I was looking at the ways that this, the more kind of spontaneous forms of rebellion and riot were in intimately linked with these more perhaps recognizably political forms of protest um, and organization. And it's from there that I began to carry out, I guess, more formalized research that eventually became the PhD thesis. And I guess one of the things that the PhD gave me the opportunity to do was to think about history more closely um, and to look in, into more depth at the histories of not simply colonialism, to better understand racism, which is something that has been done a great deal, but also something, but also innate, better enabled me to think about anti-colonialism in order to better understand anti-racism, which is something which isn't done as much, even though it is, it is done, but not certainly not to the same degree. And, that, and I think that component really interested me. And coming across a lot of the archival materials, particularly from Black power organisations like the Black Unity and Freedom Party, uh, the Race Today Collective, um, the Black Panther Movement, uh, the Black Liberation Front and others, where those connections between anti-colonialism and anti-racism were made quite vivid through their literature and their ideas, really inspired me to, to, to think through these kinds of connections in, in, in the 21st century. And I guess the way in which I, one of the ways in which I, I sought to go about thinking through those connections was through the way that what was, I guess, maybe articulated through the politics of black power and global revolution in the 20th century is today articulated through the politics of abolitionism. And I became really interested, particularly towards the end of writing the book or when I was supposed to have already finished the book, um, that new movements were arising um, of younger people um, who, who maybe were, were, were very young teenagers um, in 2011 when I first started the research or and maybe weren't even teenagers yet, some of them, um, who, were art who were articulating this politics of abolitionism and, and forms of resistance which sought to reimagine the world in very radical revolutionary ways, which, which drew on some of the radical politics of uh, generations before, but really in so many ways brought things that were new, brought things that were different, and brought things that were, I think, politically urgent um, for our movements. And so by thinking through and with organisations inspired by movements like Black Lives Matter and others, um, I began to pick out the youth organisations, the campaign groups, the grassroots movements, which were articulating alternatives to the police and prison system. And while while simultaneously building forms of organized resistance against it. And I think that hopefully leaving readers with an opportunity to consider serious alternatives to policing, um, in, in addition to the kinds of forms of resistance that exist, um, uh, for me, I think really helped to build hopefully a more hopeful uh, and maybe happier ending to a book, which was in many ways quite difficult uh, to write, I'd say. And maybe I'll leave it there for now, if that's okay. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to take part in this conversation on Adam's really fabulous, here's the book, <laughs> well-researched, crucial and politically committed, and I think also grounded book. 
Um, I was really excited, Sarah, when you invited me. So thank you so much for the invitation um, and for organizing and putting up this event. Also in the spirit to foster further transnational conversations on policing, its relation to ca racial capitalism, state racism and resistance. So in my comment, I will maybe read it so then it works better with sticking to the time. I think the book is not only a very timely intervention against processes of externalizing racism to the outside, the US or the, to the past, or to reducing it when racism, for instance, is reduced to an individual phenomenon, but it really, the book really gets to the core of analysis of policing and the colonial history and legacy of policing also with regard to Europe. And it is here where I see the book being in rigorous conversation with anti-colonial theories and black radicalism that is grounded in materialist analysis and simultaneously engages with black international resistances beyond as well within Europe. So much research has been done by organizers and activist scholars on the colonial history of policing with regard to the US, right? And the connection between US slave patrols and police was even discussed in various German and French mainstream and liberal media outlets during last year's global black rebellions. But the colonial implications of policing within Europe are seldomly interrogated or historicized. And I think Adam's book does a great job in really historicizing the colonial legacy of policing. Even in critical theories of policing coming from a Marxist tradition, and here I mean Western Marxist tradition, which understand the inextricable relation between capitalism and security, um, as Marx remind us, and thereby also understand policing as functional as well as mobilizing for the exploitation of workers and the protection of the capitalist societies and property relations, the foundational role that racism plays in this process is often overlooked. So whereas anti-colonial theorists and revolutionaries such as Franz Fanon in his work has, mainly in Le Dame de la Terre, has actually emphasized the differential character of policing when it comes to policing of the colonized in comparison to the white workers, as Fanon reminds us, that white workers within Europe experience a lightened form of policing. It is actually Adam's book that to me also speaks to these kind of anti-colonial analysis and theories because it really also looks at the impacts and the logics of this differentiality of policing in a powerful way, but it also engages with the genealogies of black resistances to policing on the British mainland um, which is then linked to the revolutionary politics of anti-colonialism. So I think the books makes at least two crucial and powerful arguments. In order to understand policing in Britain, we must first reckon with colonialism and measures of control and punishment in Britain's colonies and colonial super exploitation. And here the merging of police and military, which will increasingly boomerang back and here I, I refer to Aimé Césaire, to the British mainland and will strengthen in the later 20th century is one powerful example. But also the rearticulation of policing of so-called suspect communities, ranging from counterinsurgency, policing of the resistance of the Chinese Malay and the Kikuyu during Kenya emergency, to the moral and urban panics in Britain around gang crime and knife crime. So here it is important to note that Adam really pays nuanced attention to the historical shifts of these techniques and politics, as well as newer technologies of policing, as he reminds us, and I quote, importantly, these histories do not signify a straight line from colonial policing to 21st century racism, but instead illustrate how the routes of racial power from the colonies to the mainland have shaped present day police racism. And in order to understand current anti-racist struggles, contemporary anti-racist struggles, even the global uprisings we've seen last year, um, but also how they unfolded within Europe and specifically also within Britain, to understand these current anti-racist struggles, they need to be, as Adam argues, read in conversation with revolutionary politics of anti-colonialism and black internationalism as anti-racism on the British mainland is linked to anti-colonialism and anti-capitalist struggles for black liberation and current struggles against policing and state racism draw on these kinds of um, radical struggles and grassroots mobilizations. <clears throat> 
So putting the focus on and deeply engaging with radical resistances against policing historically and in the present, mainly by the black working class and working poor, but not only, and challenging liberal notions of anti-racism like diversity and privilege discourses or discourses that even reduce racism only to color, I read this book as part of the work of the contemporary black radical tradition. And what I really appreciate about the book is the black feminist analysis. The book not only states that policing and criminalization are, fo are foundational for the reproduction of racial capitalism and operate through gendered log logics, but is attentive to the black feminist major contributions to resistances against policing and the prefigurations of new abolitionist worlds. Engaging with grassroots organizations of black family networks and campaigns, most of the time led by black women and non-binary people, Adam argues that black feminist resistances against policing also challenge the criminalization and brutalization of black alternative family networks and nationalist respectability politics. So like this, black feminist resistance against policing can also appear as a black radical politics of care that goes beyond individual family members. The labor of black women and non-binaries in these struggles must therefore be understood in its reproductive sense. As black feminists have also argued, there is no resistance, no rebellion, no revolution possible without black feminist reproductive labor, the nurturing, holding space for and envisioning new and abolitionist worlds in the presence. Engaging with family campaigns such as the United Family and Friends campaign, Adam shows that Black women not only stand on the front lines of these struggles, but also engage in the reproductive and care work that make these struggles possible in the first place. And it is here where I would like to ask you to expand upon this a little bit more, as you also touch upon the conundrum of the feminized politics of care, a caring for criminalized racialized communities, which at the same time speaks to the dimension of the often invisible and feminized labor that situates black women and non-binaries at the heart of resistance, as Angela Davis also reminds us in her crucial text on the role of the black woman in the communities of the enslaved, but simultaneously rendered her, her reproductive and caring labor invisible. As radical and socialist black and third world women autonomous groups like Black Women for Wages for Housework within the International Wages for Housework movement once made clear, struggles around care work not only push for the recognition and payment of all caring work, but are connected to the struggles to end imperialism, colonialism and racial capitalism. So how does redistribution, because obviously wages for care work in this sense could not just mean pay them, that would mean also state co-optation and maybe even NGOization of these struggles, but how can we think or what were the kind of also practices um, in, that, that campaigns and movements were engaging in terms of redistributing um, feminized labor and how can we think of this in our struggles against policing, prisons, borders, and further carceral institutions, such as the foster care regime and psychiatric institutions, and how that, that this actually play out, um, plays out on the ground in contemporary Britain, because I think you already mentioned a lot, but there's where I really would um, like to, um, to engage more. This question also speaks to your discussion and I think crucial discussion of contemporary resistances in the sixth chapter, which I find fascinating, especially the discussion on the shutting down of shopping centers, main roads and transport hubs, which as you argue, Adam, can be read as echoing strike action. I think this is really powerful. This is a really powerful reading as it also contributes to debates on the possibilities of abolitionist anti-capitalist resistance in times of neoliberal racial gendered capitalism characterized by precarious working conditions and especially the increasing production and simultaneous super criminalization of racialized surplus populations. And I think here we can also see a shift or rather an expansion when it comes to the historical role of policing as functional and mobilizing to secure racialized super exploitation for profit and policing as now being increasingly more about controlling and also instrumental for warehousing, you also write about prisons, for warehousing racialized people which are rendered surplus. And I think this really speaks to further linking forms of radical resistances that are also anti-capitalist which abolition must be, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore and many others remind us, 
and how they play, play out in the urban centers of Europe, but also on the borders, for instance, of Europe, when we think of the, the abolition also as the abolition of borders um, and beyond. And I want, with, I want to end maybe with a last question or these are just like things that really came to my mind when reading the book, like how much conversation they actually really open. That's the question on internationalism. As the book starts so brilliantly and internationalism also runs through, um, engaging with an internationalist approach of anti-racist resistances in Britain and post -war 20, in the post-war 20th century. And I'm wondering if you could say a bit more about how the contemporary movements actually engage in internationalism. And I'm asking this because in my work on transnational abolitionist struggles and being involved with movements, I think there is a kind of internationalism. We have seen this, for instance, there was an activist meeting taking place in Berlin and in October 2019. It, it was organized by the initiative in remembrance of Uri Jalou, who was murdered in a police cell. Um, he was actually uh, burned in a police cell in Dessau in the east of Germany in January 2000, um, 2005. And at this conference, there was also Marcia Rick from Britain, Ava Gaia from France, and many more attended there and actually exchanged also kind of their experiences, but also strategies. So I think this is just one example how internationalism here also unfolds. But of course, we saw this with the international shout outs from BLM to NSARS to let Haiti breathe, connections to black abolitionist movements in Brazil, the struggles for justice for Marie Franco and many others. But it seems that plays out quite differently. Maybe one could say more subtle. And I was wondering how this relates to maybe also your analysis of nationalism, which I actually find quite powerful um, in the book. So these are just three invitations in terms of the reflections that really um, emerged from the book. And I so much thank you for writing this book. Um, I think it is very a crucial and super important contribution. And I'm certain that it will also inspire further work also with regards to other European contexts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Okay, thank you so much, Vanessa, for those really rich reflections and yeah, some, some great questions. Um, going to hand it over now to Nivi. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, for inviting me and for everybody at the LSE for organizing this. And thanks so much, Adam, for writing such an incredible book. Some of what I'm going to say is actually going to echo what Vanessa has said quite closely. And some of my questions are not that different. And I see SM laughing, so I feel like there's going to be more of that to come, Adam. Um, so there's loads in this book to recommend it. And I can't possibly do all of that justice. But for me, when I was reading this book and then rereading some bits, I was really struck by how the book manages to tie together a whole range of different debates about police racism and abolition. And these are sometimes often quite theoretical debates to the lived experience in the UK. The interviews really come through, Adam, your own experience and embeddedness in organization against brutal police brutality as a youth worker like you mentioned, and a feeling of connection to the subject is so important and it's so textured. And But there's also at the same time this kind of really quite clear sense of historicity, as well as like this bird's eye view on structures and especially the structures of colonialism, post-colonialism and anti-colonialism that shape lived experience everywhere, but especially in Britain. And I find the fact that the book is at once live to the violence of racism as well as sensitive to the like livingness and vitality of policed communities and people in Britain, that sort of multiple layers and levels at which it works really fascinating and really super rich. And one of the things that stands out about the book to me is that it's not merely a text about how bad everything is, which is often my pro proclivity burn everything down, it's all bad. Whereas you, you've managed to do something which says, yeah, we need to take all this stuff out and change things. But there are people who are already doing it and we can work with them. And there's already a way and a path, which is really quite, um, th there's like a futurity to it in, in the best possible way. Um, I also find the fact that the connections you make between racism, class oppression, 
gender, gendered ways of being in which both policing and anti-policing resistance works is really impressive. The book is, and I think Vanessa said this as well, a book that has that is about black radical feminism as it is about everything else. So it shines a light on mothers organizing for justice, the United Family campaign, whilst also showing how the rhetoric around gang violence is not merely racist, but also always already infused with hostility to working class people and inherently gendered in a way that disproportionately affects black boys and men. So it's not just the violence that the police does, but the rhetoric and the discourse that is gendered and violent towards black men and black masculinity. One of the other things that really stood out me, uh, and that's because I'm obsessed with lineages and genealogies, is, is the many, are the many different lineages you manage to trace. Uh, so prison abolition is one of them, Black Lives Matter, revolutionary resistance, all of those have rich anti-colonial histories. And you managed to like bring that together in such an incredibly rich way. Um, I limit myself to one quote, and I'm using a chocolate as a bookmark, excuse me. Um, and the quote is, it's on page 64. The manner in which colonized women were imaged and denigrated through imperial discourses and practices always, albeit in different ways, serving serve the colonial imperative to impose order onto the allegedly chaotic family lives of the colonized. The racist mythologies underpinning the colonial imposition on the private lives of the colonized reflected an authority over their public lives within the national order of the colony. As the ordered nuclear middle-class family represented the civility of the British nation, the perverted deviance of the colonized family confirmed its savagery. In other words, racist ideas about colonized people performing the wrong gender roles shaped by discourses of respectability help to justify colonialism itself. I think that's absolutely true, but I also think that that reproduction is seen today in Britain. And you, you talk about this in some ways, and I'm, I wonder if there is some sort of implicit tension or conundrum there, because I wonder if the buying into middle-class respectability, which happens within people of color and, and especially within the South Asian community, uh, but also everywhere, is merely a strategy of survivability through assimilation. Or is it something that's far more sinister and must always be apprehended as an implicit and sometimes quite explicit buying into the heteropatriarchy and white supremacy of which we are a part. So is it something that we can sometimes forgive as having to fit in and as having like a history of having to fit in? Or is, is it always the colonizers becoming the colonized? And I wonder if you have anything to say about this, like politics of civility, of respectability, of middle class achievability, the way, for instance, the Obamas were. But, but it, obviously, I mean, they're the pinnacle, but there's many more examples. Um, something else that struck me was the way in, the, in which the book treats race. So, you know, you show it's slippery, elusive, and full of complexity, sort of paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing Cedric Robinson here, uh, ways in which race functions. Uh, but you also show the, the, the manner in which police violence as affecting people of color and poor people differentially, but always already affecting them as really key. And so policing itself becomes this strategy of racialization whose abolition would benefit everyone. So it, the abolition of policing is not just for black people or for poor people. It is something that everybody should strive for because it's, it, it, it is um, something in which, uh, something that heralds a different socially just reorganization of society. And I think that really comes through. The, the sort of final point about the book that I want to make is just how accessible it is, just how lucidly and succinctly written. It's so textured and yet so eminently readable. I mean, it's something that, I'm all, that I always aspire to, but never quite achieve. Um, I'd like to end with one final point that only came to me whilst Adam was speaking, which was about 
how the 2011 riots were always political and how we need to keep the politics sort of alive. And, and I, I sit on, on a EDI committee at, at Queen Mary, and they have been very clear that they don't want to use anti-racism in their strategy, it's called the 2030 strategy, but they want to use race equality, which is bizarre. But their point is that anti-racism is political, has political connotations. Black Lives Matter is a political movement and, and race equality is apolitical. And I think that's the problem with things around diversity. It's not just the, the veneer of liberalism, but the fact that the politics of anti-racism is often stripped out of institutional ways to rectify what they see as, as racism. Anyway, I'm going to end by saying I learned so much and I felt so enraged and I'm so grateful to have Adam as a friend and colleague so I can channel that rage and work towards an anti-colonial, anti-racist, anti-carceral abolitionist future. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Nimi. Great. Thank you so much, Nivi. Uh, also, some more great questions, Adam, <laughs> for you to come back to, uh, either today or for the next few years. Um, but I'm going to hand it over now to uh, SM. Adam, um, thank you so much for this text, and it's, it is really lovely to meet you um, <laughs> right now in this in this moment. Um, and uh, so. I will say I did pre-write my comments, um, and in times I do refer to you as Elliot Cooper. Um, and so now that we've met, though, I'm going to go with Adam. Um, so <laughs> Adam Elliot Cooper aspires to do something tremendous with this text and achieves it. Um, Black resistance to British policing takes on the co-constituent forces of criminalization, racialization, gender oppression, ageism, particularly anti-youth and nods to pathologization at each intersection and meticulously connects the forms of contemporary policing to assorted colonial predecessors. Rather than attempt messless connection making, Adam gives us the nuance, the detail, the difference, the methodically excavated history. This book has many strong arguments. <laughs> many, and I will not get to them within the next 10 minutes. Um, so I'll note a few of them here that I found most striking. Mm -hmm. The first argument builds into an understanding of the necessity of black resistance and asserts that the UK maintains a hollow hearts and minds rhetoric while underhandedly serving some of the most regularized and brutalist violence any living generation has seen. This is seen today as the UK allows the overt violence and obvious segregation of the US take frontal view and the brunt of scorn, while the UK continues militarized police violence on its own people, notably in Northern Ireland and throughout heavily racialized neighborhoods in England. This importantly is also buried within myths of racism being quote unquote new to the UK, only beginning with the arrival of the Windrush generation, and of course taking middle-class English people by surprise. He instead argues that quote, the policing of black people in its many forms has always been a fundamental component of the power and wealth of the British state, end quote. The second argument is that the technologies of policing evolve from tools of suppression that were developed through colonialism and that these technologies are cultural, institutional, and procedural. So various cultural tactics of depoliticization are explored in this text from the localization of manifestations of systemic racist violence to hate crimes to the various moral panics that arise in response to the movement and descent of racialized people, to the state's mythological creation of the racist grammar of gangs. This grammar contributes to the delegitimization of Black politics through isolationist, racialized, and counter-communism language. For example, the myth-making surrounding the uh, emergencies of Malaya or of Kenya or 
uh, the labeling of terrorists in reference to armies in anti-colonial struggle. So we see historical anti-colonial coordinated action reduced to the activity of terrorists, gangs, and thugs. Similarly to how contemporary media and state agents denounce today's anti-racist social movements. The institutional technologies developed from colonialism include a gender system that is racialized specifically to exclude Africans, so it is able to justify further intrusion, segregation, and violence to protect and serve those codified as white from those who are codified as Black. Adam reviews how gender serves to reproduce imperial power. And he does this by analyzing the gendered notion of respectability, nuclear heterosexuality, fictions of Black hypersexuality, and subjugated masculinities to keenly deliver a much needed gender analysis to anti brutality, uh, anti police brutality action, and Black Lives Matter. Lastly, the technologies explored are procedural, as Adam shows us the evolution of counterintelligence as evidenced through the ever-expanding use of biometric surveillance, um, the debates of stop and scan, and the application of militarized responses. The book also has moments of striking, albeit brief, parallels about uh, kind of between how criminalized punishment today relies on procedures reminiscent of the intermediaries that facilitated colonization. So for example, in the chapter All Out War, he shows how police persecuted a rapper where rap is assumed to be a gang occupation rather than an art form by using a rap translator. He teases us with the native informant parallel, but it is of course so striking when we recall the role of informants in mapping Africa for the purposes of European colonization and align this for comparative sake with the role of jailed people pleading for freedom by alleging that they have witnessed another criminalized event. He further alludes to this in the next chapter as he integrates autoethnographic uh, auto details of his own arrest for protest. Turning to the most striking arguments, I've said striking, I think three or four times at this point, and I, I don't think this is the last time, I'm sorry. Um, but those that uh, relate to black resistance, Adam accomplishes a definition of black politics that is internationalist, informed by the ground and admittedly very inspiring. This politics is neither uniform nor exclusive to people who identify as Black, and unlike the simplistic arguments lodged against Black Lives Matter, it actually, quote, cannot be about privileging Black people or Black liberation over other freedom struggles, end quote. Rather, he defines Black politics as an interconnected global solidarity against imperialism and capitalist exploitation. His analysis, particularly in outlining the two arguments I previously mentioned, highlights how the British colonial project of acquiring and maintaining Northern Ireland allowed Britain to practice the militarized responses that would later be transferred to England and used against racialized people here. In emphasizing this connection, Adam gives us a sense of how solidarity against police violence has inflamed beyond the limitations of racial sameness. In highlighting how the political consciousness of Black migrants, quote, did not come alive in Britain, Adam offers clear examples of the internationalism inherent to the Black politics of interest to the book. He lauds the activism of Trinidadian heroine Alma Francois, who consistently centered the responsibility of the British for the extraction, inequality, and violence in the West Indies and beyond. Therefore, in asserting that we did not come alive in Britain, a quote from John LaRose, Adam reasons that the Black migrants who arrived in England to face racialized hardships were unsurprised about racism in the imperial center because they were keenly aware of the British of British racism as colonial subjects. However, they were at times flabbergasted by the audacity of the racism demonstrated by fellows within the working class, who Caribbean migrants knew suffered from many shared systems of exploitation. I point to this story as one of many in which Adam attends to the political trailblazing of Black women as his attention to the roles of Black women as political leaders internationally cannot go missed. <laughs> 
On that note, Adam highlights that Black resistance often operates through women and families. And he argues that the role of women and families subverts the respectability of the clear private woman, private family, as Black women use their personal realities of state violence enacted on them and on their families to create a new public, a future for the collective. This immobilization of the personal is political applied to the devastating truth of police violence that breaks into homes, that takes lives in custody, and that harms in daylight on the street. Lastly, a valuable takeaway from this book is in its unrepentant take on the power of uprisings. Adam does not diminish the value of spontaneous or decentralized action. He fervently rejects the notion that contemporary anti-racist movements are unorganized or unsophisticated. And he maintains that the power of uprisings is in their ability to politicize the working class. He draws a through line to tactics taken on by youth movements today, where shopping malls and highways are taken over for the purposes of consciousness raising that cannot be ignored, and that hits this neoliberal system in its commercialized center. Ultimately, this book is timely, accessible, and compelling, and I think it's a must-read text that contributes to se several fields, including criminology and sociology, gender studies, and Black studies. I do have two questions for you, um, <laughs> and there's there are perhaps part there are parts that that are going to be echoes of of what you're hearing before, and and I will reiterate this isn't necessarily for you to, to um, address today, but perhaps in future works that I read from you, um, <laughs> but. Um, I think this is a really wonderfully approachable and teachable text in the way that you've introduced abolition, but I would have perhaps selfishly loved a similarly rigorous colonial contemporary analysis of abolitionist action. Um, what does anti-colonialism give abolition? There are critiques offered of well-known abolitionists and their complicity with racism and incremental change, but I wonder what analytical gaps may have arisen given your commitment to incremental abolition or describing abolition as an incrementalist change. For example, you point to the celebrated abolitionist William Wilberforce and imply that he saw a civilized future for Africans only after empire transfused civilization. Connecting his thought to that, uh, those of, of John Stuart Mill, you say that their positions did not envisage an endpoint whereby imperial power relations would no longer be necessary. Does the incremental abolition that you envision differ from this and how? <clears throat> I'm asking because, you know, it just, it seems to be uh, an abolitionist imagination that is, that is, achieved presumably through a relationship with the state, um, with empire. So to ponder. Um, my second question is, do you, or actually, do the European prison abolitionists of the 60s inspire you? Um, I'm not surprised by the transatlantic linkages, um, especially given the critique of racialization and the role that you give colonialism in creating this policing system. However, there is also a Scandinavian lineage of prison abolitionist thought that may serve the internationalist solidarity that you put forward. And um, I, I would just be curious to hear if you're perhaps, um, yeah, just your, your thoughts on, on that that history. Amazing. Thank you so much, SM. Great. Thank you, SM. Um, wow. So that was really amazing. I think it's always fascinating to hear how how people uh, read the same text. Um, and yeah, it's clearly such a rich and and um, inspiring text. I'll show it up here again. <laughs> um, great. So there's so many amazing questions there, Adam, from respectability to internationalism to European abolition. So I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, yeah, I don't know if you are going to respond to everything, but it would be good to hear your thoughts on all of that. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to try my very best. Um, I'm not sure how long uh, I should spend doing this, but I'll, yeah, I'll try to 
be as quick as possible. Maybe I'll go in reverse order. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. We'll find out. Okay, so maybe um, to start with um, uh, SM's question, just because they're just fresh in my mind right now. Um, so thinking about um, what anti-colonialism can offer abolitionism, I think this is a really interesting question because I think for me, when I go back, in, when I go into the archives or I speak to people um, informally or sometimes formally, generally informally, who are part of Britain's Black Power movements, I, I, for, for a lot of them, the circumstances in which they were organizing felt very different. Um, and they, with the Cold War raging, with anti-apartheid movements in places like um, uh, what was Rhodesia and of course South, South Africa, with anti-imperialist movements in places like Angola and Mozambique, um, and revolutionary socialist movements in Trinidad and um, uh, Grenada and elsewhere. That they felt, I think, of course, um, that a global revolution was, they were on the cusp of some kind of global revolution, potentially. Um, and I think maybe for some, me personally, I, I really struggle, unfortunately, <laughs> to feel as if the globe is on a cusp of a, a similar kind of revolution. Maybe, maybe it's on the cusp of a different kind of revolution, but certainly it's, it's not something that's, uh, that, that's, that, that reflects what was taking place um, in the 1960s and 70s. And I think, therefore, one of the things that abolitionism can draw from anti-colonialism isn't the fact that um, there are these movements taking place where we can uh, build links of solidarity necessarily in, in these very um, more perhaps very clear cut ways, right? You know, you've got Frelimo against the, the Portuguese. You've got you know all of these kinds of you know anti-imperialist movements against these quite clear. Um, uh, colonial forces, but instead is articulating a, a vision of a global revolution, which is very often messier um, and involves resistance against forms of neo-colonialism uh, through uh, state and non-state actors, which develop forms of carceral power and forms of militarism, um, which aren't as always necessarily as clear cut as they were um, in the 20th century. And I think it means that the 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 kinds of international solidarity that abolition that might inspire abolitionism is often far more difficult to kind of articulate and comprehend and to campaign around in, in a practical way and so i see anti i see abolitionism drawing on the, that that internationalism and that anti-capitalism and that anti-imperialism but i in many ways, it has a, a very, very difficult task on its hands um, in terms of articulating um, those um, uh, those politics um, and, and uh, through its through, through campaign work and, and through struggle. I think the second part of your question is really interesting, really, really interesting. I remember one friend, comrade, who read that final chapter on abolitionism, who was just like, no, no. Not revolutionary enough what is this what is this incremental thing and i was like oh, trying to think through it with with this person and um and i wish this person had articulated it in the way that you had articulated it um because i think that's really made me think about how campaigns like defunding the police still operate within a paradigm of paradigm of capitalism right be all by its welfare state capitalism capitalism nonetheless and whether we can reduce that simply to a kind of survival pending revolution um, thesis, which um, is useful, but probably insufficient um, is one question, but certainly the danger that um, we end up with some a, a politics in which um, I, I was recently teaching a class on Rosa Luxemburg and her critique of Bernstein in which um, Rosa Luxemburg is critiquing Bernstein for thinking we can reform our way out of capitalism. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want anyone to think that we can reform our way out of um, our, the current carceral state in which we live. Rather, rather, like Luxemburg, we should understand reform as a way of um, organizing oppressed peoples, a way of kind of training in many ways, of course, Rosa Luxemburg, training working class people for this post-revolutionary world in which they're going to create and have to and have to um, rule um, collectively, right, and govern collectively. 
Um, and one of the ways in which that can happen is, of course, through um, this kind of political organizing, this kind of political action. Um, and I think that certainly thinking through campaigns like defunding the police as a, as a, for, as a mechanism of survival, but also as a mechanism of active learning um, and understanding about the kinds of problems that we're facing is certainly the kind of politics I think we should be committed to rather than the, um, a, a, a even misguided notion that we can reform our way out of the current uh, castle states or worse still remain in the paradigm of uh, racial capitalism um, which will eventually um, I guess in the minds of people like Wilberforce um, uh, civilize us enough to no longer require um, a prison state. Um, so hopefully that's answered that question. Oh God, how have we been talking for ages? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, respectability politics, Nivi. I'm going to go to that and then I'll, maybe I'll come back and do the other questions. Um, yes, I think this was, and I think I'm going to maybe merge this um, with Vanessa's question on care and reproduction, because this section of the book was certainly one of the most difficult to write. And one of the, one of the reasons it was so difficult to write was because there was, there was so much tension um, uh, among the different activists themselves, but also a tension between, and I think that this is the case with all of us, a tension within their own po the politics of individuals as well that I would speak to, right? I mean, no, 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 one, no individual has some you know, pure kind of pol politics of no contradictions. Right? Um, and one of, one of these contradictions, of course, was being militantly critical of state racism, the state more generally, the way it oppresses black people, the way it oppresses working class people, connecting that very articulately and vividly to histories of slavery and imperialism, while at the same time also articulating a often somewhat het very much heteronormative conception of care and the family. This, um, the state has taken away my child, my son. I am, I am un understanding as, as a grieving parent, right? as a grieving mother. Um, and I really wanted, and I worked as hard as I could to try to unpick this tension, right, between um, what may appear on the surface to be a um, an investment in these kinds of heteronormative norms of of care and familial relations, while at the very same time, a, a very clear critique um, and resistance to um, the structures from which these norms emerge um, and are reproduced. And I think that for some, particularly some, I don't, I don't want to name names, but for some very high profile people within these campaigns or who were part of these campaigns, who now might be part, of, have been brought into a kind of NGO industrial complex or worse still into certain parts of, of parliament um, and, and, and mainstream governments, they have certainly, um, that heteronormativity is, is the conduit through which that co-optation has, uh, has been channeled, definitely. Um, and um, but for those who haven't been co-opted in that kind of way, and I, I mean, I wasn't able to actually interview any people who've been co-opted because they're out of my reach. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, those who are remaining in the in the grassroots, they're they're working through and they're thinking through and they're dealing with these contradictions. Right? They think they're thinking, particularly I think um, with the newer generation of uh, activists. I um I spent one or two evenings of an amazing um, uh, black squat in Brixton, uh, which was or which is being run by activists who who made me feel very old, um, and but also made me feel very inspired indeed. And these young, um, mainly um, women and non-binary black people and other people of color, were really thinking through these questions of respectability and norms and. Um, and uh, sexuality and gender and how they how that how they how they use that to understand their struggles against capitalism and the state, and therefore a lot of these generally old, older women who've who've lost loved ones to the, hand, to the hands of the police are working with and engaging with uh, these younger activists and therefore being compelled again and again to think through these kinds of norms and how they are, they're articulated through campaign literature and in, in speeches and through the imagery, that, imagery that's used to win over uh, certain sections of the mainstream press or art, be articulated through a, um, 
a public inquiry and, and the court system or be, be utilised in order to uh, gain wider, more popular support for a particular uh, case of a, a black death at the hands of the state. But this issue is, in short, I guess, unresolved. Um, and I asked everyone I interviewed quite explicitly, had, you know, had they noticed that women lead all of these campaigns and why it is they think it is that women lead these campaigns and pretty much everyone had a different answer. Um, and in some ways, I think it's quite good that there is no definitive answer because I don't think there is a, de a definitive answer, but, that, but it also demonstrates that there is significant thought um, and a working through that is required for us, to, for us and, and for all activists to be able to uh, hopefully eventually reconcile this, this tension between um, simultaneously appreciating that these familial norms are emerge from structures of oppression, while at the same time, these familial norms for many people are the structures in which they organize around, um, at least in, um, in, 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 in some instances, if not, but certainly not in all. Um, I'm not sure if that's an answer, but hopefully it's, it's something. Um, okay, so internationalism. Um, really great question, uh, Vanessa, and internationalism. Um, so how do contemporary movements engage in internationalism? I try not to be too romantic about the past, which is difficult to do when you're just in the archives and everything looks so cool. But certainly I would say that there doesn't appear to be the same kind of the same kind of international international solidarity that we, we we had in the Black Power movements in the 1960s and 70s in places like Britain. I mean, when I read black um, like newspapers like the Black Voice, they have week by week coverage of strikes taking place in Namibia, where they've got interviews with the main organisers of the strikes, right? And then you have in, you go to the letters section, and someone's written a letter being like, actually, you forgot about this other strike also taking place in Namibia connected to this strike. I'm just, like, it's it's incredible. I'm like, how do you do? I know it sounds like a stupid thing to say, but how do you do this without the internet? I wouldn't know where to begin, right? Um, and yeah, there, so that kind of internationalism, I, 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 I'm, I, I don't see it in the same kind of way, certainly. And the kind of internationalism we do see, I think can sometimes be quite global North centric. There's a lot of kind of, you know, links of solidarity with North America and maybe black people in Western Europe. Um, and those, those links of solidarity, which are being, maintained with parts of the African continent are very much, I think, often linked to kind of regional powers like Nigeria or South Africa, um, and maybe less so to uh, Namibia, for instance. Um, and I think for me, the only places I really see this being punctured is through the climate movement. And I think it's, it's through certain sections of the climate movements, um, which I think black movements are, are engaging with more and more that I think the decentering of kind of regional powers like Nigeria and South Africa is really for me um, coming to the surface and you're seeing the urgency of, of appreciating whether it be small islands um, in parts of the Caribbean, which I mean, I'm a solution, so I've got a chip on my shoulder about small islands, um, but also um, perhaps uh, uh, the lesser known or, or uh, less powerful um, parts of the African continent as well. And I think perhaps thinking through the connections between the climate movements and uh, uh, wider forms of abolitionist politics might be one way of thinking, um, seeing those, those, those new patterns and those really crucial patterns of, of internationalism. Um, and finally, um, oh God, I've been going for ages, diversity, uh, I mentioned by Nivi, but I think also maybe someone, I saw something in the chat about diversity as well. Um, and this is something which I kind of, I, I've been thinking about more since finishing writing the book, and I'm kind of, have been working on a kind of follow-up article about it, partly because, of course, what emerged from Britain's Black Power movements, or what um, what signalled many of their defeats, I think, was the neoliberalisation of anti-racism, or, or as Nivi mentioned, now now being framed as race equality. And for me, I think one of the problems in Britain, certainly, with the Black Power movement, is that for much of Britain's Black Power movement, there wasn't the same kind of um, commitment to a politics of abolitionism, right? Despite the fact that people like Andrew Davis and others were really articulating this very coherently in the United States, when I talk to people in um, uh, who are part of many of these Black Power movements, one of them said to me quite explicitly, 
oh, when we were your age, we weren't talking about abolition, we were talking about global revolution. Um, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I've struggled to find really very much reference to abolitionism going through the archives um, uh, of, the, of the Black Power newspapers in Britain. Um, I, you know, I haven't gone through them all, so you know, I, I might stumble acro across some, a treasure trove, but so far I found relatively little um, in terms of that. And I think what of that has kind of enabled neoliberal cooptation to do, of course, therefore, is take their, may, their maybe their critique of police racism um, and in some ways perhaps it appears that some people who are involved in these kinds of radical black power politics have have um, have, have participated in this kind of neoliberal reformism, um, which hasn't sought to erode society's reliance on the police and prison system, it hasn't, you know, scaled back the power that the police have in our lives, but do the kind of diversity work, do the kind of training and accountability work, even do some of the kind of horrendous unconscious bias nonsense, right? Um, that's, uh, is, you know, that creates an illusion of progress at, at its very best. Um, and of course, at its worst, reinforces um, and re-justifies and re-rationalizes um, police and prison power. Um, and I think that the, I think 20 years of that kind of neoliberal race equality um, has I think re reaffirmed for radical thinkers the necessity of abolitionism. And I think you should be unsurprised that abolitionism has, has returned with a vengeance in the 21st century um, in response to that kind of um, uh, liberal um, anti-racist uh, kind of rhetoric. Maybe I'll leave it there because I've been talking for ages. Great, thanks, Adam. Uh, that was uh, really rich. And if anyone else wants to come back or ask any more questions, feel free. Um, yeah, so we did have uh, a question, which I think you've addressed now, how do we avoid getting sucked into the politics of representation or diversity and performative progress that seems to so often be all institutions are willing to offer? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if you want to say more about that. And I also might add, question as well, um, which is, I, mean, I was thinking as well, while, while you were talking and while reading the book, um, and while also reading recently for a class, Stuart Hall's work as well on labor and the left and the role of the left in these questions of policing. And of course, you know, labor is also investment and kind of bordering and in surveillance and police and, and electoral politics. And I, I wanted to ask, I mean, what story of the contemporary left might we tell if we think from the organizations or the movements that you're writing about, because it seems to me that sometimes there's this idea that the left is just this institutionalized laborist form, or maybe this more, uh, you know, younger sort of Jeremy Corbyn form. But I, I think there's also this question of, are there many lefts? And is there a way in which actually a lot of this organizing has been really crucial in bringing questions of anti-capitalism and, you know, in, in in many ways to the surface of public debate and so what yeah would what story of the left in in england would we tell maybe if we weren't always looking from this perspective of labor for instance but from the kind of organizations and people that you're writing about and just to say to everybody watching please feel free to put some questions in the chat or tweet them at us thanks sorry yeah um uh, so I'll, I'll start with the question in the chat first. I didn't, I kind of only saw the top of it. I didn't read it um, properly. Um, and then I'll, I'll go to your question if that's okay. Um, so I think that the, the pitfalls of the politics of representation and diversity and what have you, um, I think that one of the problems with it is that it can draw on certain forms of radical rhetoric. Right? And one of them, one of these kind of, I, perhaps quite uh, popular ones um, was popularized, I guess, by the Black Panther Party in the United States, right? And that was the rhetoric around community control of policing. And this was one of the real big demands that the Black Panther Party had on the U in the US, right? That we want community control of policing. And I think that both in the US and the UK, iterations of that have um, manifested themselves in uh, community consultancy committees. Um, the police, ref, quote unquote, reflecting the community, 
um, and a, a whole a whole kind of a, a, you know a whole wave of other kinds of um, what we might call non-abolitionist reforms, right, which effectively seek to legitimise and rationalise policing by creating the impression that the community has some some kind of control over them. Whereas I think in an abolitionist reading, the like, community control of policing is almost an oxymoron, right? So, um, uh, if we, you know, if you had, if the community had control over policing, it would no longer be police; it would be something else, right? Um, um, and I think that I think herein lies one of the key problems that I think um, certainly uh, a lot of the uh, black radical movements in, in Britain face, where they simultaneously were demanding um, proper policing, or they demanded the police, quote unquote, do their job, i.e., you know, reduce crime and improve public safety and these types of things, um, while at the very same time um, having a very, very fierce critique of state power, uh, state racism, racial capitalism, all of these types of things, right? There was, a, there was a very clear contradiction, a very clear bind, which I think is resolved with abolitionist thinking um, and, and, abolition, and abolitionist um, uh, philosophy. And, and I think, and I think um, yeah, perhaps there wasn't enough of it um, in in the 20th century, perhaps, um, or th that I was able to identify. And I think what's that, of course, therefore has enabled is this politics of representation, is this politics of, of diversity and, and what have you. And I think that here, I guess, we can also, again, learn from anti-colonialism. Um, just last week, I was reading with my students, uh, Franz Fanon's um, uh, Pitfalls of National Consciousness, right? Where he's kind of critiquing a bit of a diversity initiative. Of, of sorts, right? Because of course, as I'm sure many people, as everyone here knows, and I'm sure as many people here watching know, right? When when the British or the French or uh, the Dutch or Portuguese, not so much Portuguese, um, you know, handed power over uh, to the quote unquote natives um, uh, during decolonization, they had to engage in a kind of diversity initiative, right? In which they had to um, empower, you know, judges and administrators and captains of industry and all of these, um, what Fanar calls the, the national bourgeoisie, right? And so while we often think about diversity initiatives as being something which is quite new and quite modern, actually it's been going on for a very long time indeed. And I think therefore the kind of very militant critique of that kind of superficial, not simply superficial um, diversity, but crucially as well, the manner in which the people who participate in these forms of, in, in these structures of power, in these kind of diversity um, initiatives in, you know, policing or uh, other systems of power and co of coercion and control, are, are active agents in reproducing these forms of race right? and these forms of domination and control. And I think this is really, really crucial. This is where we can learn from anti-colonial thinkers like Fanon and others. How do we avoid all of these pitfalls? Um, <laughs> I think, obviously, there's no like straightforward answer because I'm an academic. Why would I give a straightforward answer? But I think that one of the things we can certainly think about part are the ways that people have created alternative systems of learning, alternative systems of community organizing, alternative systems of care, which refuse to engage and rely upon these systems of power and governance, the so-called justice system, right, for instance. And I think thinking through these, the kinds of alternatives that do exist, um, which are community focused, which are educational, um, which provide forms of, of, of care and support um, for uh, the people who need it within uh, different communities, are one of the most important ways in which we can avoid the uh, not simply shallow and superficial forms of representation, but the, the damaging and quite racist uh, forms of representation that exists. Um, and I, I try to draw, um, uh, pick some useful examples of it in the book, but I'm sure that everyone who's watching can um, think of their own local um, as well as uh, global examples of these kinds of initiatives. Um, this be, um, so Sarah's question, good thing I wrote it down because I've completely forgotten it. Oh yes. The story of the left. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, shall I tell this anecdote? So, I did a lot like when was in twenty in the I think it must have been like June twenty twenty, July twenty twenty, right in the kind of the height of the massive mobilizations which were arising uh, following the the police killing of uh, 
George Floyd. Um, uh, I, I think I was asked to do maybe a podcast or something by, um, <laughs> by a, a, a very kind of labor affiliated mainstream quite white left-wing organization. Um, and I remember obviously there's wall-to-wall coverage of these protests, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's on every news channel, it's on every newspaper. And the person in the podcast said to me, yeah, you know, we're doing these podcasts because I mean, the mainstream media just doesn't want to cover what the left is doing at the moment. Um, and I remember saying to him like, speak for yourself, mate. Like, if, what, is this not a leftist movement? Like, like if people like resist people, the, the literally tens of thousands of people taking to the streets. Is that not a leftist movement? Like, do you not, do you not think of, consider that to be a left? That's, I didn't say all of that stuff. I just said, speak for yourself, mate. And then obviously he realized what he had said and like, you know, backtracks. It was all very embarrassing and awkward in English. But um, I think, <laughs> so I think there was, I think there is definitely a, uh, an alternative or many alternative histories of the left that, um, are being told and, and should be told. And I think in some ways the British left is being forced to come to terms with it. Um, uh, partly because when I, you know, partly because they can't ignore the movements that are taking place on the streets and partly because I think younger generations of people, whether they be climate activists or, um, uh, or student mobilizations, what have you, are thinking through these kinds of questions in quite interesting and important ways. I, I certainly see it in, in climate activism a great deal um, at the moment. And, and I think therefore, yeah, thinking through those histories of the left from a different kind of perspective is really crucial. And maybe one of the ways that can be done is by thinking about Briti the British left as not being confined to the British mainland. Right? and thinking through the British left as incorporating all of the people who are under the jurisdiction of the British, um, both the working class people of the British mainland who didn't ask to be ruled by uh, the British government, but also, of course, the, the colonised peoples across the world who also didn't ask to be uh, governed by the British government, right? and breaking down those, um, uh, those political barriers as well as physical barriers um, between these different uh, groups of oppressed peoples and the movements of resistance they've engaged in, I think would be, um, well, it's not a book I'm going to write, I haven't got the capacity to do that, but some genius should, should probably write that, um, because I think it'd be great, I'd read it, for sure. Yeah, I would read it too, so anyone watching or anyone here would like to write another book, there's an idea. Um, so we have an, another question in the chat, and I know Vanessa also wants to jump back in. Um, so someone asked, do we encourage people to get involved in police scrutiny mechanisms, such as advisory groups, stop and search, race advisory groups, taser and force, while we rethink policing? And then hand it over to you, Vanessa, and of course, SM or Nivi, if anyone wants to jump in, feel free. So I get, I've quite recently actually, I've been getting a lot of emails um, inviting me onto these kinds of book scrutiny boards and what have you, um, based, I assume based off of the fact that people have seen that I've written this book, but obviously not read it. Um, and for me, the question is, do I respond to these emails or do I just ignore them? That's, that's, that is the tension for me. Like, do I send an email being like, absolutely not, these are the reasons, blah, 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 or do I just be like, yeah. Do I not bother? Um, uh, I haven't decided which one of those um, two options to go with. Um, sometimes I respond, sometimes I, I ignore. Um, I mean, I've even been invited to the Home Office so this, um, to like talk to them about, I was just like, what are you joking? Like, is this a joke? Um, anyway, um, um, so I think that those kinds of scrutiny boards can are generally very unhelpful. Um, when I was When I was doing youth work, I did a lot of work um, that engaged with these kinds of community consultancy committees. Um, uh, and I mean, people, I'm sure, people watching, I'm sure, are familiar with the fact that, you know, these kinds of, inst you know, local institutions that are funded by, controlled by, moderated by the police um, only serve the interests of the police. Um, and at the very best, um, if you have experienced a, an overt, um, uh, some overt violence or brutality, um, you might be able to let off some steam and shout at a senior officer um, and tell them how upset you are and they'll promise you that disciplinary procedures will be followed and 
you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that, that's basically it. I mean, there is footage of the black chair of like the, I think Bristol Police Community Consultancy Committee being tasered in an alleyway by the police, um, right? This, um, I mean, so even if you have joined the committee, even you personally are not safe, right? Let alone, you know, actually having some kind of impact on, on, on in the wider community. So I, I personally, I would, I would avoid those kinds of um, initiatives like the plague. And I mean, there are some great takedowns of them in the Black Power newspapers from the 1960s and 70s. There's a, one headline called "The Traveling Circus Comes to Town," and it's all about police community consultancy committees um and um and they draw links between these kinds of committees and um and uh colonial collaborators uh during um uh, yeah during formal colonization in ways that are really vivid and cutting and fantastic and so yes i would i would encourage people to not join those committees and instead visit an archive and read the black voice from 1974. <laughs> Great, thank you, Adam. Um, Vanessa, did you want to? Yeah, thank you. I was just thinking um, also a bit, again, also with SM's question, because I think it's also interesting um, to historicize abolition, of course, also within Europe, but not only within Europe, because I, I'm just wondering, to me, anti-colonialism and radical abolitionism is very closely connected. It goes back to the Haitian Revolution. That's anti-colonial. It's abolitionist. It goes back to the work of W. E. B. Du Bois, who obviously also had an anti-colonial stance later, particularly. And what I learned from like current abolitionists, radical abolitionists like Gilmore and others, is also that the kind of um, well, it is the antagonistic contradiction to racial capitalism, and I think that's what also distinguishes it from for instance, some liberal white abolitionism that even if we look at the Haitian revolution or some of the like then British folks that you also name in the book, but you also have these with French folks like Victor Scholcher and others, right? They advocated, as far as I read it, and I think there's an important difference um, for the abolition also of enslaved labor to wage labor relations, whereas like black radical abolitionism, which I also consider anti-colonial, um, would rather go to, okay, it, it, it actually needs the abolition of the system of production and reproduction that made possible enslavement and colonialism in the first place. And it is through working that, that alternatives already appear. And the Quilombos, for instance, in Brazil, which were anti-colonial too, right, at the same time emerged. I mean, 30 million people lived, lived in Panama. Us, right and they're still defending that to really like think about okay how do how do we see also abolition radical abolition and anti-colonialism connecting um and then we can see that a lot of the newer movements are also actually tracing parts of anti-colonial histories in their resistance i was wondering um how you how you think about the relation between anti-colonialism and and abolition um, It's a really great question. It's a really great question. It, it's something that I think that I think that maybe I started my history a bit later than a lot of the kind of um, anti-slavery uh, movements and certainly the kind of um, uh, uh, maroon societies, um, which I think were, uh, would be a, would have been a, a really interesting additional historical dimension to the book right because I kind of I kind of don't really talk about that very much do I which is a shame I kind of wish I, I had but um, um, and I kind of only really focus on I kind of begin the clock in the 1930s um, which is probably too late for um, to do a, a good job of anti-colonialism um, but unfortunately um, yeah here we here we are um, but yeah I think I think if if I could have or maybe if I had um, yeah if I if I'd done it differently maybe I would have thought thought through slavery abolition and abolition of, of, of the imperial systems which made slavery possible, right? That we see, of course, incredibly through the Haitian Revolution that so many people have written about and how they sought to abolish not just the system of chattel slavery, but sought to abolish race as we know it, right? Through their constitutions and what have you. And I think that 
if I, I would have loved to have thought through how those how how we could draw roots r o u t e s um, from these forms of abolition to um, the the uh, abolitionist visions that we see in the twenty first century um, and. And I'm sure you could kind of draw those links through people like CLR James and others who've kind of taken those ideas through uh, the Black Power movements and the Black internationalisms of, of the 20th century. Um, and I certainly do think that there are, there, there, there are such clear and important connections um, to be made uh, between uh, these histories of, of Black resistance that go uh, way beyond the kind of, the, kind of the, the 1930s and then 1950s, which I, I think through in the book that I think would be really useful and I think crucial in fact for us to better understand um, how we can deconstruct, dismantle racism. And I think this is particularly important in a time in which a lot of Black politics can slip into racial essentialisms um, and not seek to dismantle, think, create the impression that we can get rid of racism um, without getting rid of race. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, hundreds of years ago, the Haitian people or, had already realized that they needed to get rid of both, I think speaks volumes to um, the, the urgency of, of the fact that we, we, we're, we're centuries later and, and are still um, battening not just against racist movements that want, want to uh, reproduce race, but also at times purportedly anti-racist movements um, that reproduce forms of racial essentialism that I think could benefit a great deal from learning from these, these histories of, of abolition. Great, mm -hmm. thank you, uh, Vanessa and Adam. That was a really great note to end on, I think. Um, Great, thank you all so much. This was such an incredible and really rich conversation. And uh, I think what I really appreciated as well was, which I think is something that is so important in anti-colonialism as well as this idea of people are always living in other ways and there are always alternatives. And I think that already is such a kind of politically important point to always be making that there is something outside of capital, racial capitalism. So. Thank you all. Just a reminder to everyone to buy the book and great. I hope everyone has a good rest of the evening or day, depending. I think we're all on this side of the world. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Nivi, SM and Vanessa. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Thank you so much to everyone again for both the invitation, Sarah, but also Vanessa, Nivi and SM for your thoughts and, and comments and, and questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.